There are so many heroes here today. There are so many great examples of standing up against tyranny, telling the truth in the face of adversity. And I talked a little bit about this yesterday. William Rodriguez, imagine, he's the master janitor in one of the towers. He has the master key. The building's on fire. He stays in there with the firefighters. He takes them up to the top. He personally escorts hundreds of people out, physically pushing 50 people out of the door, goes back in, and the building collapses on him, and he's the last emergency, last non-emergency worker to be pulled from the rubble. But that's not where the courage ends. That's where it begins. William Rodriguez was then whisked to the White House all over national TV, hundreds of shows. He was everywhere. He's this big hero. The Republicans wanted him to run for Congress, wanted him to be their minion. He was offered millions and millions of dollars, but then he kept talking about, well, there were explosions going off, people with their skin burned off, and before the buildings collapsed on the bottom floors, this was happening, and they said, shut up about that and just take the millions. How many of you could say, I'm not taking the millions? He did it, so he not only saved those people, he also refused all those millions of dollars, and they've paid off so many of the victims. But he said no, and now he's traveled the world from Venezuela to Malaysia to Japan, dozens and dozens and dozens of countries on national television speaking to the people there's not a news blackout globally they've been in Germany they've been in England they've been in Italy they've been in Russia they've been all over the world and now he's here for you today in Los Angeles and William Rodriguez has told me this is one of the last times he'll be in the US giving speeches and talking because he believes he can have more of an effect globally so one of the real heroes of 9-11. Wasn't a firefighter, wasn't a police officer, didn't even sign on for it. He went in there. That building was on fire. He went in there. He stayed in there until it collapsed. And so we're honored to have with us today William Rodriguez. William, come on up here. I tell you, I just love being around all these heroes. Here you go, my friend. <sighs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me set this up. All right. I just came back from Malaysia, uh, where we had uh, Dr. Tum Mohadir Mohammed, the most powerful man in Malaysia, listening to our story and opening the doors all over the nation. And uh, it was a historical moment. Historical moment because it was the first time that a survivor of 9-11 goes directly to a Muslim country to talk about 9-11 and the effect that it really had on them. You know, we have criminalized, demonized, the Islamic world because of 9-11. So to have the actual last survivor going over there and telling them what really happened was an eye-opener. Here they ha you have uh, Dr. Mohammed. The lady is uh, the director, no, I'm sorry, the chancellor to the United Nations. This is the meeting, the second meeting we had with him. And the press coverage was national. We went on every television show. We were presented for 10 days, prime time, on the news, opening news every single night. And when I left, thank you. When I left on Friday, the actual uh, comment on national news was that the Malay mindset about 9-11 has been changed forever after our visit. Prior to that, I went to Venezuela. Venezuela, I had a meeting directly with the second man in power after Hugo Chavez, uh, Nicolas Maduro, the president of the National Assembly, who actually was very concerned about my safety. He gave me uh, uh, formal protection in Venezuela. He said, well, you know, you're in a very difficult situation here. Mind you that you probably didn't get the news over here, but an FBI agent, when asking around the hotel, for the list of the guests of the, of the hotel that we were staying at. 
And uh, when they find out about it, they gave us five bodyguards around the clock because they said, it's a possibility they could do something to you in our country and blame us for it. <laughs> so we're going to protect you. And they ordered that a documentary about my life was, fi was to be filmed on the grounds of the palace. For five days, I was filming at the palace so they will have a historical evidence if something happened to me. So it's not in this country alone that they have done that. Here's a march that I did against the war uh, in New York. I was highly criticized. I'm on the news in New York. I'm the only expert about 9-11 for Telemundo, Univision, and CNN and Espanol. And I was highly criticized on, 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 on that march that I did. So I said, okay, no, no problem. I won't do it. I do something different next week. I didn't have soldiers. So, the 9-11 report. Okay. Let's pass the report better. That's a truck. I was pulled right on from under the truck. You see that black hole right under the truck? That's what I was pulled from. All right, all right, don't hold it against me. Remember, I did not know. I did not know. And when they name you national hero, whatever, you know, you just go. <laughs> um, well, media expert for all the um, uh, different channels, the newspapers, I was writing uh, legislations. I was just a janitor at the World Trade Center. <laughs> and I was passing laws. I did the Tax Relief Act for Victims of Terrorism. I work very hard on it. I work on uh, legislation for uh, scholarship programs for the victims and the survivors, and they all passed. So, you know, at least we did something positive. Uh, this is the investigation request. Now, I'm going to start about 9-11. Let's see. Uh, can you hear me? OK. Let me go on the front. That way you can. Well, for those who don't know me, William Rodriguez is my name. I worked in the building for 20 years. 20 years of my life, I was a janitor. I was a person in charge of cleaning all the stairwells of the North Tower. From the 20 years that I have in the building, 10 of those years, I worked at the governor's office. Governor Cuomo was a prior governor to Pataki. And I used to be the one that cleaned his office, did the whole organization of the press conferences, and uh, I guess by osmosis of being 10 years in there, I learned the whole process of how to set up a press conference after 9-11, how to set up uh, uh, the bills that you saw in legislation, because it was 10 years of learning and listening without knowing that I was doing that, of how to deal with politicians. And that's how, I, I guess, God really prepares you and gives you a mission. He really gives you a mission. Now, it's been five years, five years of my life dedicated to this, five years that I have been, uh, since the moment that I was pulled from the rubble uh, to this moment, fighting for victims' rights, immigrants' rights, the truth about 9-11, disaster management. I mean, one issue after the other against the war in Iraq. That's what an activist uh, uh, does. They jump from one issue to the other until they make a change. We have saw that after 9-11, that beautiful thing that we had in the 60s, that activism was totally erased because of the Patriot Act. The Patriot Act totally eliminated 50 years of civil rights. Now, when they use 9-11, our tragedy, our despair, to create this policy, this agenda against the people here and abroad, of course, I had a responsibility to open my mouth and complain. Now, <laughs> now 20 years of my life in that building, uh, I'm just going to jump into the story of what happened to me that day. I went to work late 
And again, I really believe that uh, there was a mission for, for me that day because if I was there at the regular time, at 8 o'clock, I would have been at the top of the building, at windows of the world, and I would have died. So I, I came in late, 8.30 in the morning. I'm on the basement. The building has six sub-levels of basement, B1, B2, B3, all the way down to B6, six sub-levels. On the B1 level, you have all the support companies for the company uh, that dealt with, uh, with the World Trade Center. Mine was ABM, American Building Maintenance. Now, that company actually have the structural contracts, has the painter contracts, they have the mechanical contracts. So our office was on the B1 level. As I was talking to a supervisor at A46, we're like chit chatting, and all of a sudden we hear, pa! Very strong, <laughs> boom! An explosion so hard that pushed us upwards, upwards. Now, 20 years in the building, remember that. And it came from the basement between the B2 level and the B3 level. And at that moment, I thought it was the mechanical room where they have all the pumps and the generators for the building that maybe a generator just blew up on the basement. Now, 20 years in the building, you know something that comes from the bottom and something that comes from the top. At that moment, everybody started screaming. And it was, I mean, the explosion was so hard that all the walls cracked. The false ceiling fell on top of us. The sprinkler system got activated. And when I went to verbalize that it was a generator, we hear, boom, all the way on the top, the impact of the plane on the top. Two different events, two different times. Later on, I thought that they probably didn't synchronize it well. <laughs> because that came out on the investigation that probably the, this explosion was to weaken the base and the foundation of the building to be synchronized with the heat on the top so it will fall automatically, which it didn't. Now, when that happened, Screams everywhere. A person comes running into the office saying, explosion, explosion, explosion. His hands were extended, and his skin was pulled from under his armpits all the way to the top of the fingertips, and it was hanging on both hands. And I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a piece of clothing. And then I realized it was his skin, and I said, what happened, what happened? And when I look at his face, finally, he got missing pieces of his face. A black guy named Felipe David from Honduras, which I, who I didn't know. He worked for Aramark, the company that put all the soda machines into the machines, uh, the candies into the candy machines. And he was located on the B2 level when this explosion happened, and he put his hands to cover his face because there was fire. And that's how he got burned. That's Felipe David here. See, the, this whole thing was hanging. On the other side, you don't see it there. He was burnt, burnt as well. So at that moment, I said, don't move. I was going to pick up the phone to call the emergency medical unit that was located on the building two, the south tower. Building one and building two connected through the basement. And I went to, to pick up the phone when I hear another explosion. And that was so hard that the building oscillated so much that the walls cracked again. And people thought that it was an earthquake because they're going under the, 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 the door uh, frames thinking that it was an earthquake. I say, no, I think it's a bomb. And the reason I said that, again, osmosis, because I survived the 1993 bombing. I was talking in an elevator in 1993 for four hours. They have to break through a wall to get us out. So automatically, I thought it was a bomb. And I said, we got to get out. So I took those 15 people. I led them out of the office through the loading dock, through a hill outside the building with Mr. Felipe David on my back until I saw an ambulance. Get out, out of the building. I stopped the ambulance, put Mr. Put Mr. Felipe D David inside. He goes into a coma. 
And that's when I hear automatically, a plane hit the building, a plane hit the building. There was a security guard standing right next to me, and his radio was going, There's a, a, a plane hit the building, a plane hit the building. So now, I'm at the base on the building. When I turn around, you know when you're in the base on the building, and you look up, you don't see the top? That's exactly what happened. But I saw the hole, I saw the fire, I saw the smoke, and all of a sudden, I realized that I couldn't see the antenna of the top of the building. And what came to my mind right away was, oh my god, the people from Windows of the World, the restaurant that was on the top of the floors of that building, 106th floor. I had breakfast with those people every morning. I started cleaning the stairwells from the top down. So they have a, an employee's kitchen, and I will go there and, and, and talk with these people all the time. Mind you that the 76 people that died there, I knew them all. So all of a sudden, when I see that, I start screaming, we got to go back. we got to go back. Nobody wanted to go back. The supervisor, Anthony Saltalamachia, said, no, Rodriguez, you stay here. A guy three times my size, <laughs> weightlifter, and he's telling me, hey, just stay here. Say, no, we got to go back in. We got to help those people. He said, no, 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 you stay here now. I took the radio from the security guard, and I ran inside the building through the basement all the way again to the North Tower. There was water all over because a sprinkler system, again, why would the sprinkler system get activated on the basement when the plane hit on the top? Think about it. Does that make sense? No. I find water all over. I run straight to the South Tower, where they had the OCC, the Op Operation Control Center, that was created after 1993. They spent $155 million to retrofit the building and to supposedly straighten it out after the bombing and to set up a whole security system. And that was actually the control center. You know what? When I got there, I started hitting the window. There was nobody there. There was nobody there. The control center, where they have all the cameras, all the recordings. I found one guy called uh, Jimmy Barrett. He was on the other building. He didn't know what was happening. I was screaming, you got to get out. You got to get out. That gives you an idea. He was on the basement on the South Tower. That gives you an idea how many people died on the other tower without ever knowing what happened on the basement. He just happened to come up from the basement. And then I found a lady that worked for the Marriott Hotel, staying in a podium like this on an entrance for the employees for the Marriott. She heard the whole thing. But she said, what are you doing here? Get out now. And you know what she said? I can't. I'm a new employee. I don't want to get fired. <laughs> Just the ignorance. Because she didn't know. So I push her out. <laughs> Ran to the other tower. On the North Tower, again, there's water all over. I found one guy that worked for the recycling company. And he said, I hear screams. The World Trade Center had 150 elevators in the complex. I put my ear on one of the elevators, and I heard two people stuck in the elevator screaming for help, saying, we're drowning. We no, we're going to drown. That didn't make sense either. I'm like, you know, I'm trying to, to understand what's, what's going on. He said, what? And it was all the water from the sprinkler system was going the, down the elevator shaft, and they got encapsulated because the uh, uh, elevator went down between the B2 and the B3 level, and they have all the water up to here. So at that moment, and let me tell you, I was never a believer. I was agnostic. I didn't believe in anything. And uh, at that moment, I said, God, please help me. And I looked around, and I found a metal pipe in an area that was supposed to be clean of construction debris. And I took that pipe, put it on the wall, uh, 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 on the doors of the, uh, of the elevator. 
and with the help of uh, Barrett, we opened the doors. The doors opened this way because it was a freight elevator. When the bottom door hit the floor, all the water that was on my side went rushing in with more power. And the screaming was worst. And when I looked down, it was too deep. And I said again, God, please help me. And all of a sudden, I remember that in the area where they have the trash compactors for the building, the electricians, they always have the ladders that they use to uh, 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 change light bulbs and, and uh, do the wiring. They always had them tied up with chains on the loading dock area. And they tied them up because you could go there with the truck and steal them. And I said, let me find one. Let me find just one. And as I got there, Ladies and gentlemen, the only one that was not tied up was the longest one of all of them. So that was a miracle by itself. That was there to be, to be used. I took that ladder, put it on my back, went inside, went on the elevator shop, dropped that, went in, opened the grid, got these two people out, one, one of them, Salvatore Giambanco, a painter for the Port Authority, which I did not know either and a delivery guy. And he's telling me that there was a huge explosion in the basement. There was fire, and they tried to cover themselves from the fire. They went into the elevator, and the door closed, and they started going down the elevator, and they lost power. That's his actual words. Got them outside the building, put them in an ambulance, and went back into, into the building. And everybody, oh, don't go back in. Why are you crazy? I say, no entiendo, no entiendo. <laughs> <laughs> no entiendo, no entiendo. But I prayed in English. And he say, ay, Dios mío. <laughs> uh, so I get back into the basement, and I found one person, police officer David Lim. Now, he was the person in charge of the K-9 unit and in charge of all the rescue efforts for the Port Authority. And he said, Willie, do you have the key? I said, yes. He meant, did I have the master key? There were only five master keys in the whole complex. The Port Authority had the other four. They were trained on egress, escape, first aid. Rescue. They were the first one to run out. <laughs> this is the master key, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> we call this the key of hope because it gave hope to a lot of people. I said, let's go. We get to the base, uh, from the basement to the lobby. And when we get to the lobby, the firemen are there, waiting with something called the fire access key. It's a key that they put on any elevator. And if the, if the elevator is on the basement, they will go up. If he's on the top, it will go down to pick him up. I said, what are you waiting? There's no elevator. Follow me. I know the best way to go up. We started going through the staircases. Now, it was so hard for those poor people because they have so much equipment in their bags. We're talking about 70 to 125 pounds of equipment in their backs. And as we go up, they started bumping against us, the people coming down. Because the stairwells were not wide enough. Look. Well, it's not, I thought I had the staircases there. But anyway, I'll find the picture you like. Uh, it was not wide enough. So we start making it up the staircase. And as we go up, we hear small explosions going off. Pa, pa, different areas. And I said to the firemen, what's that? And they said, one of them told me, I think it's the gas tanks from the kitchens. Now, that did not make sense because it was a class A building. 
All the kitchens were electrical. All the kitchens were electrical. So that did not make sense. What are those explosions coming from? Now, again, why is this key so important? Because class A building, the codification in New York is that any skyscraper, three doors will not open on the staircases, one will open. Three won't open, one will open. So we have to go and open all those doors that did not open. In 1993, the fire department lost so much time breaking doors, trying to get to the floors. So that's why this key was so important. And it opened the whole thing, the whole complex. And the reason I got this key was because in 1996, I fell down the stairwell, and I didn't get help for several hours. For three or four hours, they couldn't find me. So I did a, an arbitration case against the Port Authority, and I sued for the key, and I got the key. And I won. And, and, and I, I guess that's when I got the experience of suing and, and doing all this. <laughs> all the losses after just was an upgrade. Uh, so as we go up, you know, one thing that people don't talk about is that, and it breaks my heart, is the amount of uh, screams that I heard of people stuck inside the elevators that were not being able to be helped. People screaming for help. You ask me what is the biggest nightmare I have, I have two, and that's probably the one that I recall almost every day. Every time I go in an, into an elevator, if I go up to my room over here, it's just in my mind, listening to those people screaming for help. And it breaks your heart, it really does. So those, those people never had a chance. So I continue going up. One person tells me, there's a, there's a man in a wheelchair on the 27th floor that needs help. I told the fire department, I went down two floors to let them know, let them know that you know, there, there was somebody on a wheelchair. And the reason I went down, remember, I have no equipment in my back. I have no fireproof jackets. I have nothing. And I did the staircases every day. So I was, in, in that time, in a better physical condition than even the firemen. Because that was my routine. That was my job. So when I go down and I tell them, he, uh, the fireman tells me, we leave the handicapped people always for the last, so they will not impede the rescue effort of the majority of the, of the masses. We get there. When we got to the 27th floor, when we got to the 27th floor, the whole unit of firemen collapsed on the corridor, one after the other, because they couldn't continue going up. It was physically impossible for them to continue. They took their equipment, they took their jackets, they took their boots, they dropped themselves on the floor. A very shocking moment for me, because I said, oh my god, I feel like I have to go alone now. Remember, uh, David Lim said, Willie, do you know this floor? I said, yeah, I know this floor. He said, where can I get water? He said, on the other side. There's a machine. So let's go. He breaks the machine. We start taking bottled water, putting it on trash cans, and bringing it to, to, to the firemen and giving them uh, the bottled water. I remember I called my mother from a phone that was working in that office. Call her. My mother is in Puerto Rico. But I wanted to let her know that there was an accident in case she heard something on the news that I was okay. When, I, when she picked up the phone, she was like, what are you doing there? Everybody in the world knew but us what was happening. She said, get out now. And I said, I can't. I'm helping these people. They don't know the building. But don't worry. And I lied to her. I said, I'm going to get up to a certain part, but I'm not going to get to the area where they have the fire when my actual intention was to go to windows of the world and help my friends. That was my motivating and uh, the power that was actually pushing me to go to the top. Because I knew these people were stuck in there. 
I hang up on the phone and I have calls from my supervisor say, Rodriguez, abandon the building right now. Abandon the building right now. I say, I can't. I'm helping the fire department. He says, that's not your job. Get out now. I turn off the radio and I continue going up by myself, <laughs> opening door, letting people out until I got to the 33rd floor. When I get to the 33rd floor, and the reason that I went to the 33rd floor it was because I had a closet inside there where I have all supplies. Every 16 floors, I had a little closet with supplies. And I wanted to get the dust mask to give it to the people that were coming out because of the smoke that, that it was coming in uh, the staircase. It was an acrid smoke. It was like ammonium uh, stuck in your throat. I spoke to Professor Jones about it. I spoke to uh, experts who said it, you know, it sounds like ammonium nitrate. I mean, I'm not an expert on those things. And as I went in to get those masks, I found a lady sitting on the floor, trembling, blonde lady, no shoes, in a fetal position. And I said, what are you doing here? Get out. And she said, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. She was a new employee. She didn't know where to go. Now, that gives you an idea. Also, the World Trade Center did drills twice a year, twice a year, with a population of 50,000 employees. Come on. It should have been a mandatory training that anybody that works in the building should have learned where the exits were. And we are, that's one of the lawsuits that we are actually trying to, to establish, that every building now that is uh, over a certain amount of floors should have mandatory training because the turnaround of people getting fired, retiring, getting hired is a constant. And at the World Trade Center, imagine it was a city within a city. It was a constant. This lady didn't know what to do. So I stood her up, put her on the stairwell. There were people coming down. And I say, take her out, please. As I went back inside the office, the, the, the corridor, I heard the strangest thing. Now, on the floor above me, the 34th floor, I heard heavy equipment being moved around. You know the dumpsters? When they scratch the floor, those uh, steel dumpsters, it sounded just like it. It was the first time that I felt fear through the whole ordeal because it was an empty floor. I knew for a fact that was a hollowed out floor by construction. There was no walls. There was no ceiling. There was no wires. There was nothing there. It was a floor that was uh, uh, emptied out over eight months before. So there was nobody supposedly to be there. And for me to hear that kind of sound really scared me. So much that I bypassed that floor. That was the only floor I did not open the door. And I continued going up until I got to the 39th floor. When I got to the 39th floor from the opposite staircase, there were three staircases, A, B, and C. Police officer David Lim came out came up with uh, two firemen. And as we were talking about what was going to be our next move, we hear, boom! The impact on the other tower. And it was so hard that our building oscillated so much that we lost practically our footing. And all of a sudden, we hear, boom, 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 boom. And on the radio, we lost 65. We lost 65, meaning that the 65th floor collapsed floor by floor by floor by floor up to the 44th floor, the sky lobby, five flights away. And I started screaming, we got to go up. We got to go up. Officer Lim said, Rodriguez, you've done enough, but you don't get paid for this. And I said, what? I'm going up. And he said, no. You stay here, you're still a civilian, and you are my responsibility. And I said, sorry, I'm not giving the key to anybody. I'm going up. And uh, he said, better if you give me a hand with the person on the wheelchair on the 27th floor. 
And he said, you know, David, I'm going to go down, but I'm coming right up. I'm going to help you with that, but I'm coming right up. So I ran down to the 27th floor. When I ran to the 27th floor, I screamed to the fireman, I have orders to get this guy out right now. The guy was taken out of the wheelchair. He was put on a rescue basket, all tied up. Three guys stood up and said, let's go. We grabbed him. We started going down the stairwell. As we go down, it was like the movie The Tower in Inferno because chunks were coming all over us from the ceiling, from the walls. And then the light, uh, the fluorescent lights, the long ones, that's what we had on the stairwells because the building was oxidating so much, you could hear, the, hear them breaking in unison, going floor by floor, clash, 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 clash. And we lost visibility as we go down. Emergency lights, some floors they worked, other floors they didn't. Calls for us to get out, out of the building, we never got them, even though they said that they did. That was a famous lawsuit against Motorola because the radios didn't, didn't work out. As we go down, we make it to the lobby. We make it to the lobby. When I get to the lobby, what do I see? The elevators, the elevators for the passengers are open from the bottom like this. The doors, the aluminum doors. Indication that something powerful came from the bottom. I mean, I don't have to be a genius to realize that something was wrong there. And all of a sudden, one of the firemen tells me, please, go get the ambulance ready. Now, the other tower already collapsed as we were going down. I remember telling the guy on the wheelchair, don't worry, after this, we're going to get a beer. And he was going, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I don't even drink. But I wanted to give him motivation, disposition, enthusiasm to continue. And I was looking for a way to, to digest what was happening. As, as I was told to get the ambulance ready, I realized that the whole area on my left was destroyed. There was dust everywhere. The uh, cameras, the security cameras, were hanging by a wire. That beautiful marble, anybody that went into the World Trade Center, remember that marble at the entrance that was all pulled out, broke into, into pieces on the floor. And the only thing you saw was the cement patches where the marble was before. I get to the front of the building, the West, West Side Highway entrance, the main entrance. As I get there, all the glass is broke into pieces. There's not an intact piece of glass anywhere. There's no revolving door either. I get to the front, and all of a sudden I hear, don't look back, don't look back. The police had the area cordon now on the World Financial Center, almost a block and a half away. And they're telling me not to look back. And what do you do when they tell you that? <laughs> I turn around and I look back. And ladies and gentlemen, I saw the bodies of the people that jumped out of the building. I saw like they melted on the floor because of the impact. And that lady from the 33rd floor that I helped to escape, I found the cut in half because a glass came from the top of the building and cut it in half like a guillotine. And I said, God, what is this? What is this? And I hear, run, run, run. I look at the, at the left side, and I see the Marriott Hotel almost gone. Bodies everywhere. And I said, God, please help me. And the only thing I see is a fire truck in front of the building. And I just slid right under the fire truck. And all of a sudden, the building started to destroy itself on top. And you hear, boom, boom, boom. And the truck going down. And all I said at that moment was, Please don't let my mother see my body in pieces. Let her recognize my body. Please, please. I just didn't want my mother to see what I just saw. 
there was silence all of a sudden. And, and, and this cloud of uh, dust came from all over. And then I said, I'm not dying of being squashed to death here, but now I'm going to die of asphyxia because you couldn't breathe. You feel your lungs expanding and, 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 and contracting. And I said, this is going to be a slow death. And all I have in my mind was that poor lady cut in half. The most dantesque thing I ever seen in my life. And at that very moment, I just said, I'm going to die. This is it. Many of you heard that I was a magician for 30 years. And one of the things that you know, and I used to do the escape acts, you know, with the straight jackets and all those things. So one of the things they teach you is just, you know, make it last. So that's exactly what I did. I tried to control my breathing. I tried to control my uh, uh, concentration and, and see what happened. But I was expecting death. Luckily, CNN, Global Vision from Brazil, they were across the street and they pinpointed the area. The last man came out from that area. And that's how they started doing the, the rescue effort. I was pulled from the rubble. They were confused because I have a, a, a jacket that says uh, uh, safety uh, 11. It looks like um, a jacket for the fire department. So I, they thought I was a fireman. So I stayed within the perimeter, continuing looking for people Remember, and I'm sorry to be graphical, remember I went back to the truck to see if uh, there was anybody there. And I was pulled right at the nick of time because the tires of the truck just blew out when they pulled it out. So I was saved right on time. I went to the area where they had this bridge that connected the North Tower to the World Financial Center. That collapsed on top of uh, fire trucks. I went under. I saw two boots. I pulled the boots. I stayed with the boots in my hand. And when I looked inside, I found the legs of a fireman. And I started screaming. And all the firemen came over. They started to rescue the, the body because there was nothing else there. And I stayed there for, for hours. I came out just to get water. And that's when I was grabbed by the news. And that's the news that you saw all over the world during those three days when they started interviewing me. And I say, I'm talking about the, the explosion that I heard, the person on the wheelchair, the whole thing. That day, I did not sleep. Neither I did the following day. I was being called from all over the world, round the clock. And the problem was that. The lady from Global Vision from Brazil <coughs> sent a press release with my phone number on it. <laughs> with my phone number on it. So I was getting calls from Montevideo, from uh, uh, Argentina, from uh, Kuwait, I was like, from all over. I'm like, how am I going to pay this bill? <laughs> anyway, after they recognized me, after during that time, I uh, organized the families. I did the Hispanic Victims Group because I saw that the Hispanic were not getting an a equitative and balanced uh, distribution of the funds that were given for the, for the victims. So I went to Congress with a group of families to ask for a commission to be created to investigate 9-11. Uh, and as we went over there, you remember that the president said, we don't need an investigation. We know who did it. And that was the wrong thing to say to the families, because then we pushed very hard, and we got it. <laughs> the problem is that we want to have a family member as part of the commission. And they said, we don't want to allow that. And they never permitted it. We never had it. Now, we created the Family Steering Committee. We put 127, 167 uh, questions out to the commission. From those, 27 were answered. What happened to the others? Then I was one of the last persons to testify 
but they wanted my testimony behind closed doors. Everybody was testifying on national TV. You remember those hearings? I testified, and up to that moment, I thought they were going to do the right thing until the final report came in. When the final report came in, what a surprise. My testimony wasn't there, even though I was wine and dine by them. 20, 22 people that I put them available, firemen, victims, survivors, that had similar experience, were never called. Ladies and gentlemen, David Lim, well, th this is, uh, can you put this on? We were cleaning the basement of Tower 1 of the World Trade Center. We heard something like a bomb. And the light turned off. At the exit door, there was this, fire, this ball of fire that came down and knocked us on the floor. We were hit by hot air. And the room was full of smoke. At that moment, I believe it was a bomb. I said, Chino, let's get out of here. I can't get out because his leg was wounded. I knew there was an explosion. And there was hot air. My hair got burned. Now, this is uh, Jose Sanchez. He I mean, he was uh, available to testify. He was in the basement. He was never called. The Chino guy, whatever who he was, was never called either. Now, Felipe David survived. He was on a coma for 13 weeks. They made an encounter for television, national television. And his story went all over, again, the world, but in Spanish. You see, our story in Spanish is perfect. I'll put it out there. We, we cover it. In English, it was totally edited, constantly. Salvatore Giambanco survived. His story was never told, even though the encounter was done for national TV. David Lim. Now, this is the reason that we do this. We owe, it, we owe the truth to the victims, survivors, and those affected by 9-11. The reason I do this is because I lost 200 friends of 9-11. 200 people that don't have the ability to call for the truth. They don't have a voice. And I'm alive because of a miracle. I was sent to the governing institute to train for political office. When I started asking questions, they all went the other way. You see, I, they wanted me to play ball. So, the motivation, the disposition, and the enthusiasm, I don't care about anything else but I want the truth. You see, I've been offered everything, like they said. I had a television show on PBS in New York. They offered me what? <laughs> Movies, books, everything. I always say, no, I forget about it. It's not money. I was homeless. I raised $122 million. And don't take my word for it. Go on the internet. Do your own research. And you'll find it there. I did national PSA, public service announcement, for the community to raise funds. I never received one penny. I found myself living under a bridge. So don't get fooled by the old, this old image. This is the same suit I had yesterday. <laughs> the only thing that changed is the tie. So I, you know, I do this by donations. I go all over the world, and, uh, but you know, we need to get the truth. So please stand up.
take, a, take it upon yourself to ask real questions and make a change. We need activism. We need uh, disposition. We need you to actually ask those people in power to tell you what really happened. They have an agenda. They have used our tragedy to create this world war on terrorism, which is just a fallacy. Everybody else in the world is more prepared and with more information about 9-11 than we are. So please, get the facts. And God bless you. Listen, uh, take some questions. Thank you so much. God bless you all. I'm going to take some questions. Also, I want to say thank you to Charlie Sheen and uh, S.I. Morales, who is here, the great actors. Uh, Big clap for them. Come on, big applause for them. We're talking about the possibility of doing my movie with these two people. Yes? Uh, Willie, you're a real inspiration. Um, you're really something. Uh, this is the first time I've ever uh, heard you actually speak. Uh, I'm curious about something. Uh, we had the loose change guys. I'm, I'm, I'm Ken from Arizona, you know, 9-11 Truth of Arizona. I guess you guys have heard of us by now. Anyway, um, uh, we had the loose change guys in Arizona in uh, mid-April, and right about the same time we heard that you were with uh, Jimmy Walters down in Venezuela, and that, right. th and that they were showing loose change all over Venezuela, but I've never seen anything, heard anything about that. Could you, yes, could you tell I us got, about that? Yes, I, I got, uh, with the opportunity that I get on all these countries, because they all open the doors to me, uh, I feel the need to push uh, certain things to be presented, and since Dylan was very gracious from the very beginning to give me all the rights to present it anywhere I, I felt it was needed. I was able to get it on national television in Venezuela, three times on national TV on the government official station. So also in Malaysia, we're going to bring uh, Dylan Avery to do the same thing over there on national TV. So we've been able to successfully present it as, as possible, as, ma as many venues we can. Uh, were you around uh, during the time when they were shutting down the building a couple of weeks? That was standard practice about the power shutdown. A, a lot of people ask about that. Uh, twice a year, they do the power shutdown to test the levels of the water pump, pumps and uh, generators. So they will shut one building and then they will shut the other just to test. But the person that was in charge of that was Mr. DeLeo from the mechanical room died on 9-11, so we will never know exactly what happened. But did they, uh, there was some sort of a upgrade of the electricity, is that correct? Or uh, were they upgrading? A computer upgrade, is that correct? Or do you know anything about that? Well, a lot has been said about that. We still don't have, we, one of the things that we are asking for is, uh, those papers, those information about the contracts, who did that, and uh, we still haven't, we cannot speculate until we get the, the information about that. But I guess I was asking, were you at the building during the time when? Yes. You were there when? Oh, the no, no, Actually, no, no, the day of the shutdown, no, they do it on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. Oh, when you weren't working? Yes. Oh, okay. Even though I work a lot of overtime on the weekends, that weekend I did not. And just, I was just wondering if you could expand a little bit about whatever you might have known about this 33rd floor. I'm sorry? About the 33rd floor. 34th floor. 34th floor. What, whatever you might know about it. or did no, you It was ever... an empty floor. It was a, you, could, you didn't even have access through the elevators because they locked the elevators. It will not stop on that floor. And then the only way to get through it was through the freight elevator. I mean, I'm, uh, uh, through the staircase. I'm sorry. Did, did you ever go up there at all? 
Before, Did yes. Uh -huh. Before, what? because you, remember, I had an office on the 33rd floor. So I could go and have, a, I, mean, I, I will take lunch and I want it to be in a quiet place, I will go to that room because I have the key. And, and you saw nothing there? Not, empty, hollowed out, nothing whatsoever. First, I want to say thank you. And uh, finding out the truth about September 11th is the decision, uh, or is the, why I made the decision to run for United States Congress. Thank you so much. And my, my, co my question to you is, uh, are, are you sure you can't reconsider your decision to, to run for political office? We sure would love to have you uh, be a political representative at some point. The thing is, I did so much on both sides, I mean, with the Republicans and with the Democrats, in terms of getting uh, um, benefits and things passed, uh, that I found that it's better to be an activist and stay with the truth than be part of uh, the dancing game that you have to do with the political office. But, but if it gets to a position that I have to run as an independent, I will do it. I hope you do. Thanks. William, I commend your courage, you your so humanity, much. your patriotism. Uh, recently, you were in L.A. In, in another conference, and Channel 52 Telemundo in Spanish covered your, the interview with you. Yes. And um, John W. Spring called me. I guess you know John W. Yes, called yes, me yes. because I speak Spanish. And uh, he called me to see if I could uh, intercede to have that airpiece, and I called Channel 52 the commentator, Mr. Ruenga, as I believe is his name, and I asked him whether he was going to present your, your interview because your, uh, your comments are, are very controversial, of course. And he says, well, we need an opposing viewpoint. Correct. And I told him, you've had the government version for the last five, five, five years. That's the opposing yes, viewpoint. Yes, yes, yes. He says, well, no, we really have to get someone. So I, I called his boss, and I ended up making like three phone calls and eventually, they did air your piece about two weeks ago, although I couldn't get yeah, a copy. It took, it took almost three months for them to air the piece. And it was people like you putting pressure that the information was to be brought out. So I thank you for that effort. Uh, I did speak to the reporter, and the reporter said, you know, I'm getting in a, into a lot of trouble because they don't, they don't want to show this. They really don't want to show this. And they're putting an FBI agent to talk about the opposing view and the, I said, what, the, what, what is the person saying? Oh, it's a lady saying that you're crazy or probably, the, okay, I'm crazy. Well, well, that shows the reluctance even by the Spanish news media here in the United States, which is controlled. Correct. In my, in my, even my, though, in even my though I'm very well respected by Telemundo National, and this is Telemundo local who did this. But the national, I, I, I was on Telemundo National last week uh, doing two pieces.